Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. Welcome to In the Frame, Exploring the DIA. Today we're going to be looking at our recently reinstalled Islamic galleries. Now it may seem strange to define an art by a particular religion, but there is a reason for it. On the one hand, the art that we see here comes from a tremendous geographic spread, all the way from Morocco to Malaysia, from Burkina Faso to the Philippines. But nevertheless, most of this art is governed by rules and traditions that come out of Islamic ideas. For example, the most famous one is that the human being not be depicted, the idea being that it's blasphemous to do something that was uh, done uh, by God himself. But even that, as we'll see, was not always followed. The first Islamic objects came into the DI's collection in 1898. And when the new building opened in 1927, two galleries were given over to the art of Islamic countries. William Valentina, the great director here from the 1920s to 1945, was especially interested in Islamic art and himself brought in a number of very significant objects that are now on display again. And I think it's important that we show Islamic art in an area of the country where there is such a large population of individuals of Middle Eastern origin, and also important at a time uh, when things are going on around the world that so distorts Islam's historic significance. Taking us through the Islamic galleries today is an expert guide, Dr. Heather Ecker, who heads up the DIA's Department of Asian and Islamic Art and is herself curator of Islamic art. Here we are in the gallery in a section called Silk Road Inspirations. The Silk Road was a vast network of trade routes linking China to the Middle East to the Mediterranean world. Along the Silk Road were traded luxury goods such as silk, gold, silver and cobalt and artists who lived along the route were inspired by the imported goods from abroad. In this gallery we explore artistic conversations between the Islamic world and China over time starting in the 8th century and ending in about 1650. One of the most important luxury goods traded along the Silk Road from China to the Middle East was porcelain. Porcelain was prized in the Islamic world from very early times, from about the 800s until the, even the 19th century. Artists in the Middle East um, were inspired by porcelain and wanted to imitate it, but porcelain is notoriously difficult to imitate because it is made of special clays that are only found in China. In Turkey in the 1480s, the best early modern imitation of porcelain was made in a town called Iznik, which is south of Istanbul. The Ottoman sultans were the patrons of the ceramic industry at Iznik, they used Chinese porcelains for festival occasions in the palace, but they wanted uh, dishes to use in uh, everyday settings. So, as you can see on my right, this Chinese dish on the right was made uh, in the early 15th century, the Ming Dynasty, and it was made in a shape, a rather large shape, that was popular in the Middle East. It was made for export to the Islamic world. And on the left, is, a, is one of the earliest dishes produced at Iznik. You can see that it is directly inspired by the Chinese dish. It has the same type of decoration. It's very white. The glaze is very brilliant, just like the porcelain original, but it also has some differences. It's much larger for one thing. And this reflects the kind of dining uh, that was carried out in the palace where dishes were served communally, so food was presented in large dishes that we call chargers.
One of the most important luxury goods traded along the Silk Road from China to the Middle East was porcelain. And what we're looking at here in this showcase are examples of the earliest Iraqi imitations of Chinese porcelain. So these were direct products of trade with China. At this time, so in the 800s and 900s, the Chinese porcelains that arrived in Iraq were finely potted, smooth-shaped bowls, as you can see in these objects. However, they were simply white in color. And in Iraq, they did something very interesting. They not only found a way to imitate the appearance of the Chinese bowls without actually making porcelain, but they also developed two different surface decorations that had repercussions over a long period of time. One of these is the use of cobalt to create a decorative pattern on the surface. Cobalt um, is a mineral which, when fired, turns a bright blue color. And as you can see here, the patterns that were painted by the Iraqi potters, actually in the south of Iraq, in Basra, have nothing to do with Chinese art, but really from uh, local artistic practices. What's very interesting in the bowl on the lower right is that the artist has actually signed the bowl. So it says in Arabic, Amal Saleh, made by Saleh. And this dish really is an indication to us that these artists must have been very proud of these very fine dishes that they produced. What's also interesting in the dish at the top, so there you see a camel, uh, with, which has a, a sort of structure on its back, is that most of these goods were carried along the Silk Road by camelback, uh, wrapped in straw. And so you really see literally here the beast of burden that would have brought such luxury goods uh, from China to Iraq. In this case are two objects made in Iran in the 1200s, both influenced by Chinese imports along the Silk Road. At the top is a mirror. It's made of bronze and it's polished on the back. It imitates a kind of small uh, mirror imported from China at this time. At the bottom is a bowl, which as you can see is glazed in a single color, imitating monochrome wares imported from China produced during the Song Dynasty. What's interesting in both cases is that although mirrors were imported from China and the lower dish is imitating a kind of porcelain also from China, the decoration on both of them had nothing to do with Chinese decoration but rather with local interests. So as we can see here, both of them had pairs of sphinxes which were known as talismanic animals. They're on uh, household wares to promote a, a healthy life, a good life and happiness. And actually the mirror has an Arabic inscription uh, around the edge, which actually has literally words such as happiness and prosperity and long life, which tells us something about the aspirations of the people who own such objects at this time. In the previous case, we saw objects which look like Chinese objects but have decoration which derive from local uh, sources. In this case, by contrast, we have objects also made in Iran, but instead they have Chinese decorations. So we see flying phoenixes on this bowl and this mirror here. We see flying cranes at the top on that uh, small tile, as well as lotus blossoms all of which are Chinese motifs. And these decorations derive from Chinese luxury goods imported during a period when the Mongols ruled over the Middle East. So let's say around um, 1250 to 1300. Here in this final case, we see objects from the 1600s made in Iran, and they all have very obvious connections to imported items from China. At the top, we see a dish in blue and white, very similar to the type of blue and white porcelain uh, made in China at this time. Interestingly enough, it mixes motifs from a variety of periods, which must have been copied from a collection held in Iran of Chinese porcelain. On the bottom right, we see a dish which is green, like a Chinese celadon, and interestingly, its decoration 
really has nothing to do with China, but rather is inspired by Central Asian designs. And then on the left, there's a small bowl uh, with a flying phoenix, which is done uh, in a red, imitating a kind of porcelain from China with uh, underglaze red decoration. What's interesting in Iran, they didn't actually know how to do that, so they used a local technique known as luster, which gave a very similar effect. Here we have some examples of ceramics made at Iznik, Turkey in the 1500s. If you remember, in the Silk Road area, we looked at a large blue and white charger that was very similar to a Chinese example. And this here is really the continuation of the same industry. So as you can see on my right, there's a dark blue dish with white uh, leaves. And in this dish, you can see that the first color they added beyond the dark blue was a turquoise color. And then here, you can see that another color they added was green. The most interesting and perhaps distinctive color is a special red which is found on Iznik dishes and particularly tile work. And it was probably developed uh, for tile work because it could be seen from very far away. Basically, to make red in ceramics is very difficult. Um, and what they figured out at Iznik was if they used a special clay called Armenian bowl and they built it up, they sort of piled it, when the glaze ran over it, it became this absolutely brilliant red, uh, which you can see here. Ottoman luxury goods, including ceramics, carpets, and textiles, were widely exported around the Mediterranean. And here we have an, an example of an interesting story of that. So the plate here below is a dish made at Iznik in a style known as the Four Flowers style. And as you can see, it has uh, carnations, roses, tulips in red and blue, and this very interesting serrated leaf called a saz leaf, which actually does not exist in nature. And we know that this dish, which was made in about the 1560s, was exported to Italy, where this example on the right was made, which obviously copies the same design. And then this tile at the top was made in Syria, probably at Damascus, also copying the same kinds of motifs. Um, and then here, the last dish uh, is a dish also made in Iznik about 130 years later. And we can see that the quality has declined. The dish is much smaller the white is not as bright, the glazes are running, but we do see that this style, the four flower style, had currency for about 130 years, which is quite interesting in the pre-industrial era. Islamic art had a tremendous influence on the art of Europe. And I first met Islamic art when I was studying British design of the 19th century. And I think it's easy to see the influence that a Persian textile like this had on an artist, architect, designer such as Owen Jones. And here's a piece of textile uh, by him. In fact, Owen Jones published a kind of dictionary of ornament. And in that dictionary, he had page after page of examples of Islamic art. And when that book was published, it sort of blew open a whole world uh, for European and other architects to use a different kind of decoration from the classical and medieval forms they'd been following before. So here in the Ottoman section, we have, for example, on view this textile, which is a luxury textile from the 1500s, produced probably at the city of Bursa. And if you look at the background, you can see that it is made of gold threads. So those are silk threads, which are actually wrapped in gold, as well as a velvet nap. And this is a technique called voided velvet. So the nap is only pulled through 
um, where the design is. And interestingly enough, in these kinds of textiles, we see the same kinds of flower motifs that we see in ceramics. For example, here is a type of lotus blossom. This is a kind of carnation. And this is a type of tulip. And we see those designs, especially the tulips and the lotus blossoms, in carpets as well. For example, over here on my left is a fragment of a court carpet made for the Ottoman court, actually by weavers in Cairo. Um, and you'll see exactly the same types of motifs here, for example, a lotus blossom, here a type of carnation, as well as a tulip. And it's quite interesting in the sense that you have um, exactly the same kinds of motifs in textiles, in carpets, and in ceramics, creating a kind of, um, a kind of consistent uh, decorative atmosphere um, around the Ottoman court style. The largest thing in the gallery is a large case in which we will rotate uh, carpets, large carpets, every six months. So the present rotation is a textile very much like the uh, silk textile from Borsa that we saw before. This time the background is made of silver threads, so that silk threads wrapped with silver rather than gold, and the design is done in voided velvet. And as you'll see as you look closely, the same kind of flower motifs are found in this textile which was used as a summer carpet at the Ottoman court. Uh, you'll see tulips and you'll see carnations. What's quite interesting about this particular textile is that as the border was woven into the design, it's actually made of uh, four long strips which are each about a foot and a half wide, uh, sewn together along the long side. And in order to make it appear like a carpet with the border going around the whole edge, uh, two, of the, two of the strips are flipped in the other direction. So as you walk around the carpet, because the nap of the velvet is going in two directions, it appears to change color, creating an interesting animating effect, uh, which must have been intentional. This tiled niche was made in Iran probably in the 1850s, and it was probably made um, as part of the restoration of the Gulistan Palace Gardens in Tehran at that time. So in the two scenes at the top, in one of them we see Joseph who is enthroned on the left side with a um, sort of um, halo around his head, and then on the other side the king of Egypt. And in both cases there's something about the story of Joseph being sold at the slave market. The Persian inscription underneath is actually part of a poem which talks about buying Egyptians at the slave market, which, as we all know, was part of the story of Joseph when he was sold uh, by his brothers into slavery in Egypt. Around the other parts of the, the niche are other kinds of motifs that were popular at the time. We see feasting couples uh, in gardens drinking wine. We see acrobats, dancers, and musicians and then in the border around the edge, we see the signs of the zodiac. The signs of the zodiac really have to do with questions of fate, uh, predetermination, and God's will. So really there's a kind of moral imperative in uh, tiled niches such as these, which are beautifully drawn, uh, very well executed, but also have meaningful um, iconography. This section of the gallery is called Sacred Writings. Within Sacred Writings, um, here and behind me, are cases displaying manuscripts from the Islamic world, encompassing all of the different sacred traditions, whether Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. In front here is a Quran, probably the most important and spectacular work of art in our collection, uh, which was made in the 1400s written on a special kind of paper which was sent from China as a diplomatic gift to the Mongol conqueror of Iran, Timur, so Tamerlane, or his sons. And it's absolutely magnificent. It's very large, written in a wonderful uh, script on 10 different colors of paper. 
Above it is a tile. Uh, it's sort of a technique called uh, cut tile or mosaic tile, which comes from a building in Iran or Central Asia. We're not sure which one. It's actually one of four surviving panels of this type, and they would have actually decorated the outside of an important building. But you see motifs which came into Iran from Central Asia and originally from China, um, such as the lotus blossom in the center. In this section, we are exhibiting manuscripts in a special kind of case that the visitor can come and actually lean on the case to look at the manuscripts. And we use a special kind of lighting called LED, which not only doesn't generate heat, but also creates a very even lighting, which we can uh, adjust fairly easily so as to make it within the limits of what's uh, recommended for the preservation of manuscripts. This section of the gallery is dedicated to the Mediterranean between about 1250 and 1500 or so. In this case, on my right, uh, we focus on Mamluk, Egypt, and Syria. And uh, the sort of emblematic techniques that were perfected in this period include enameled glass and inlaid metalwork. Most of the works of art in this case were either made for royal or noble patrons. For example, this uh, glass bottle was made in Egypt or, or probably Syria uh, for one of the rulers of Yemen. What's interesting is if we see the assemblage of all these objects together, it's almost like a deconstructed um, living room of a Mamluk gentleman. So this is a tray stand. On the tray stand, we would place the tray, and then the bottle, and then the glasses, and the uh, candlestick on the right would, of course, provide uh, light. Um, these three elements here are actually from a door and so they would have been part of the interior decorating of such a, such a setting. Another influence on 19th century British art can be seen in this lusterware. Lusterware made in the 14th and 15th centuries in Spain. You see these very tight forms, this lovely gloss, these tight natural forms, all closely packed together to conform to the shape of the bowl and the vase. You see something very, very similar in this piece of lusterware by William de Morgan, where Victorian naturalism aside, you have these natural forms, in this case, a couple of feline uh, animals, uh, very, very tightly packed into the circle of the dish. I have been a member of the DIA since I moved to Detroit about six years ago, and I also started volunteering at that time, too. I uh, enjoy seeing the museum and have for the, all the years that I've lived here, and I knew from the beginning that I wanted to volunteer here, and specifically that I wanted to work with the visitors and help them with the, uh, the experience of seeing the art. So that, uh, that led me to see what I needed to do to become a volunteer and, um, and it's working out great for me and I think that the visitors are enjoying seeing the art with me too. The other thing I really, really enjoy at the DIA is the other volunteers that I work with. We work as a real team and it's, uh, it's just a joy to come down here and join that group and do what we do. The DIA, the Detroit Institute of Art, is such an important part of Detroit. All of the cultural things that we have in this same area, the, the other museums, we all work cohesively to make art available to the people of Detroit. And art and culture are so important to the real soul of a city, a city has to have its industry, but it also has to have its art. And I'm very proud to work for the museum and do our part to do that for the city of Detroit.
Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of In the Frame, taking a look at Islamic art, a category under which you see the art of many countries and many eras. You can get more information on the DIA at dia.org. Until next time, this is Graham Beale, your guide to one of America's great museums, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. An encore presentation of In the Frame is available on demand for viewing at DetroitPublicTV.org.